Perfect. So it is now uh, streaming live on Facebook. <coughs> uh, apologies for this delay. Uh, Doc, you want me to start for a minute? Yeah, sure. All right. Hello, everyone. Namaste and welcome to today's session. My name is Ravi Santlani and I'm the founder of Swoon News, India's largest media platform for the education sector. I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Professor Sukhata Mitra. Professor Mitra won the first $1 million TED Prize in 2013 to put his educational ideas together to create seven laboratories called Schools in the Cloud. These results question the ideas of curriculum, examination, and the meaning of knowing itself in the internet world of 21st century. He retired in 2019 as professor and principal research investigator at the School of Education, Communication and Language Sciences at Newcastle University, UK, and is currently professor emeritus at IIT University. So a recorded version of this webinar will be available on our Facebook page at the Red School News, and we shall send you an email too with the recording. If you're facing bandwidth issues, we suggest that you turn off the video so that you can listen to the audio with a better clarity. And we'd love to hear from you. If you're attending via Zoom, you can use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer your question if time allows. And if you're there on Facebook, please do comment, and we'll try to uh, copy that and paste it on the Zoom so that Doc can see and he can uh, answer. And for those of you just joining us, welcome and enjoy the webinar. Over to you, Professor. Well, uh, thank you all for joining in. I noticed you're from Not as well. So, uh, you know, welcome to those people who have woken up either too early or are staying up very late in order to listen to all of this. Um, you know, I, I, I don't really know uh, where to begin uh, because I could have taken off from where my work uh, points, but there's a problem with that. The problem is that all my work had to do with schools and with children in you know, remote areas, children out of school. But then all of it had to do with physically present children. The main results we got from all those years, almost 20 years of work, is that whether in school or whether out of school, children given access to the internet in a safe and public space can actually learn almost anything by themselves, provided they work in groups, okay. Um, particularly unsupervised groups, you know, a, a teacher standing around seems to actually detract from the process rather than help it. So those results are interesting if you are a school teacher, and if you have a functioning school. Those results are also interesting if you are a government and you have a problem in an area where there are no schools. Those results can be used in either of those places. But suddenly, we have a change. The change is that there are no schools. Well, I'm putting it dramatically. You know there are schools, but they're closed. But let's put it this way, that we are in a world where, at least for the next few weeks or months, there are no schools anywhere. To compound our problems, not only are there no schools, there are no children gathered together anywhere either. The playgrounds are empty. So we have this strange new kind of world where we have individuals and families who are isolated into small physical spaces in their homes and the children are there with them. This is by and large what is happening. Um, what happens to education under those circumstances? Or, in fact, what happens to life? You know, I've been following people who have been tweeting or, or uh, you know, posting about this sort of thing. And uh, I notice 
a couple of things. I'll, I'll raise them as a question to you. I, I don't have the answers, but I think I have a few questions. So let me raise those questions. First question is, you know, a lot of people say, I don't have anything to do, which, is, which could be true. But my question is, when you say, I have nothing to do, do you say that happily or do you say that sadly? I notice that a lot of people are irritated by the fact that they have nothing to do. So my question to you is, why is that? Shouldn't it be um, the other way about? Uh, you know, should we not say, jolly good, I have nothing to do. But somehow, uh, that's conditioned out of us. You know, other species in the world. If you have a dog at home, you'll notice that it's entirely happy. Uh, if it has nothing to do. It just curls up and goes, goes off to sleep. And they seem to be able to sleep for endless amounts of time. But we can't. Secondly, what will the children do? So, uh, I, you know, I, I try to be in touch with children, not always very successfully, but as far as I can. And I noticed that uh, children say a few things that are interesting when they're in this isolated situation. For example, they would say, I wish I could go to school and meet my friends. Um, fair enough. Uh, there's also an implicit assumption that they actually go to school to meet their friends. That's the main reason why they go to school. Uh, I haven't actually heard any parent or teacher say that a child at home has complained, saying, I wish I could go to school so that I could learn math. So maybe we should ask ourselves if they want to go to school to meet their friends, and they're not saying that they want to go to study anything, then uh, what does that tell us about the whole process that we were managing, and I say were managing because we are not doing that now. Uh, what does it tell us? However, uh, if that sounds a little grim to you, let me put in another question. If I take a child who is isolated or who is, you know, with their friends or whatever it is, and if I were to ask them a question, if I were to ask them a, a really cool question, if I were to, uh, you know, if I were to ask them, uh, why do kangaroos uh, stand on two feet like us, while the rest of the animal world, everything's on all fours? Uh, there is a certain age, usually between eight and 10, when children will engage with a question like that. They might make a wild guess or etc. And as my work points out, if you allow them to access the internet, if they could be in groups, which they cannot right now, they would actually give you a very deep answer to the whole thing. Um, so while the child is saying that I want to go to school to meet my friends and not saying I want to go to school to study whatever, I don't think the child is also saying I want to go to, I, I don't want to go to school to learn. I don't think they say that. It's just that we don't make a distinction between studying and learning. There is a major distinction, isn't it? A really major one. If I were to tell you, uh, when you sit at home doing nothing, do you occasionally learn some things that are new? And the answer would be yes. I mean, not learn as in, you know, read a book and learn, but you, you learn stuff. We learn stuff all the time. And now, because of our phones and because of the internet, we learn things at an astonishing rate. The only thing is that that learning is not structured. 
So when we look at children and their phones, we tend to believe that they're wasting time. I'd like to question that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not you know, saying that they don't, but I'd like to question that. I'd, I'd like to say, do you actually know what they're doing? And do you actually know if what it is they're doing is not producing any learning at all. Um, if you think about it, you might get a rather interesting answer. That leads us to another dimension. You know, in schools and in universities, we have curricula. Curricula meaning we have a list of things that we say students should know. Somebody has obviously assembled such a list. You, you can guess who would have assembled it. There are curriculum committees, you know, and there are bodies all around the world who sit periodically, periodically meaning about once a year, I think, and build up these lists of things that people should know. I am not very sure about the value of that list in today's world. Let me give you an example. I once asked a child who was about six years old, and uh, I think six or seven, and, and just learning how to multiply. I asked him, uh, so how do you multiply two numbers? And uh, with a very serious face, he said, with my phone. Now, that's not supposed to be the right answer, you know. You're supposed to do it using another way. You know how you have to write the top number, and then below that you have to write an into, and you have to write the second number, and then you have to do all sorts of things, and then you have to add up stuff, and then finally you get a result. Uh, everybody is supposed to know how to do that. I don't quite know why, actually. Well. There's another interesting thing. You know, there was a time, I don't know, some of you may remember it, there was a time when we used to have something called a logarithm table. And the logarithm table was a miraculous thing. It converted multiplication into addition. So if you have to multiply two numbers, you find out their logarithms from the logarithm tables. Then you add up the logarithms because of the it's so much easier to add than to multiply. And then finally you take the result and you use, oh my God, an anti-logarithm table. And then you get the answer. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> well, you neither find the logarithm table or an anti-logarithm table anymore, nor is anybody, I think, taught how to use that method. So my question to you again, in order to multiply two numbers, the answer, I use my phone, is not right. The answer, can I use logarithm tables, would produce a reaction from the teacher somewhat like, huh? But the answer, yes, give me a piece of paper and I'll use the 18th century method for multiplication, but that's all right. You can get an A plus if you know how to do that. So there's something wrong with the curriculum, you know. We, we put in stuff into the curriculum, things that we think are very important to know. We very seldom take anything out of it. And we sometimes arbitrarily add or arbitrarily subtract from a curriculum. Children, I think, can sense that. When they can sense it, the question in their heads and the question in my head would be, do they really need to know that? Can we take a curriculum and can we go point by point on that curriculum? Now, this question, the answer to that question for a particular point is, no, I don't really need to know it because I can always ask Google 
or I can ask Alexa. Is that answer bad? I think schools need to deal with that problem. I'm not saying if it's bad or it's good. That's for you to decide. I don't run a school. But you do need to engage with that issue. Is it bad to, to ask Alexa or to ask Google instead of knowing something? And if Google and Alexa are always right in that particular thing, can we take it out of the curriculum? Well, I know a lot of people are going to be up in arms uh, saying, no, no, that's not right. You know, I mean, after all, uh, there are people who are, uh, you know, programming uh, Google and Alexa and they will become the dominant powers on the planet, as opposed to whom? They will become the dominant powers of the planet as opposed to whom? The curriculum committees. Well, who would you rather have? So uh, that's another point that you need to think of. But now let me tell you about a problem. I know that children in groups can learn almost anything by themselves if you ask them an interesting question. I know that. And if you look up self-organized learning environments, S-O-L-E, you will see that there are tens of thousands of teachers in the world who know this method, who have used this method, and who by and large like this method. But it has a certain requirement. You need a few screens, large ones, okay? I must make this point again. Those little screens, those phones, they have a problem. You can't share. You can't share the picture on the screen. Well, maybe two people can share it, but not a group of four or five children or four or five learners. For four or five people to share, you need a big screen. Okay? First requirement. So in a soul, you have a few big screens with the internet and about four times the number of screens as the learners, so that the learners sort of group around the screens, they discuss with each other, they go and searching an answer to a question, and they learn. That's basically the method. Now, take this virus-induced isolation that we're in. Well, you can ask the question, easy enough, the way I'm asking you, there are 500 of you listening and I'm asking you these questions. But you can only respond alone. You could Google my question, you could think about it, you could figure out stuff, but you are doing that alone. And then I can notice that some of you are actually typing it into your chat and say, I think it works like that. But there's one vital thing missing. You're not able to chat or discuss this with the other people who are also searching. And that in my work is one of the most important ways in which learning gets self-organized. The ability of learners to group together and to discuss with each other, to pass ideas along from one person to another until you get spontaneous order. Does that sound a little familiar to you? Well, it should. You know, all around us, there's something else that's using that method. Communicating with each other and creating spontaneous order. It's nature's way. Connection, collaboration, self-organization, and spontaneous order. I was able to get that into a classroom, but I'm struggling to figure out how to get it into this environment where the learners are isolated. We need a couple of tech guys to put a solution together. I, I, you know, I think we have all the technology we need for doing that. We need to have a way in which the 500 of you can actually interact with each other 
in response to a question that I give you. You can actually using your chat, uh, you know, your chat list, but perhaps we need something a little more efficient. If we could do that, then it is possible that we would have or we would be able to organize a soul, a self-organized learning environment on the internet. Then we wouldn't care if there was a physical classroom or there was not. We might even say it's okay not to have one. Can we get to that? Can we take this opportunity to move the education system away from the bounds of the classroom and onto something else? A lot of teachers are trying to do that. But I will raise a word of caution there. You know, we adults, given half a chance, we slip back, backwards, into our own past. So when I see a lot of people who deal with e-learning, they're trying to recreate the classroom on the internet. So why? It's a bit like saying, if all the cars in the world were to disappear, and all we had were planes, then people should use planes to drive around on the highways. But you don't do that, you know. Planes are meant to be flown, not driven. So we, we need some teachers to think about what next? What happens next? Rather than how do we get back to where we came from? We don't need to go back. We could tell our virus, thank you, sir. We'll move on. So I've spoken for a long time. I'm going to leave you with that and, and see if, if, you have, uh, if you have some questions. I'll probably just stumble over them, but I'd like to give it a shot anyway. So um, let's see. I'm going to I'm going to try uh, this thing called Q and A. Uh, let's see. I I have Dr. Vinod came up first on my screen. How to teach for college students? Any new innovations to teach? Wow! I don't know. You're telepathic, Vinod. You know, I after I retired from Newcastle University last year, I uh, I came back uh, and got an honorary position at NIIT University uh, for two months a year actually in Rajasthan. Um, it, it, it's a it's a nice place, you know. It's a pretty campus and it, it borders Rajasthan and Delhi, just where the desert is about to begin. You know, kind of romantic. But anyway. There are about a thousand children, a thousand students in there. And the question I'm trying to answer is, what happens to a college or a university uh, if we allow the internet in? Change the need to know list for different subjects. Can we redefine what it means to be a graduate? Can we redefine what assessment means? Not only in schools, but also in, in a college. I haven't actually finished that work, I'm just about beginning. Um, maybe in a few months, I might have uh, a few answers there. Uh, incidentally, I'm setting a lab up at that, in that university, in uh, NIIT University. And guess what the name of that lab is going to be? The name of that lab is What's Next? It's called the What's Next Lab. All right. Let me see who else has a question. So I have, um, let's see, I have uh, Lina Ashar. Uh, do you believe this is a time of great opportunity? Boredom is essential to creativity, resilience is important, etc. cetera. Uh, don't you feel we're, we're overreacting? You know, I mean, there's no point getting depressed because that's not going to help. So the answer, do I think this is a time of opportunity? My answer would be, it had better be. 
Are we just going to sit or run with our tails between our legs or are we going to say, no, here's a new way to do stuff now because there isn't the old way anymore. Um, I don't know, but who's going to make that new way? Well, you have to, you know. You have to, you have to proactively do it and tell us, not just you, Rina, but all of you. Ravi, do, do you have any questions that you've spotted? No, I mean, there is one. Uh, uh, Nisha Jain uh, is asking, uh, I'm just falling down. Uh, you know, uh, another interesting way is, I mean, how do you connect preschoolers age two to three years? Won't getting screened to them this early be harmful? Well, uh, a lot of people ask me that. You know, the thing is that everybody knows that even two-year-olds can handle an iPad. When I started my work, if, uh, for those of you who remember an experiment called the hole in the wall back in 1999, I used to think that eight-year-olds can handle the internet by themselves. And people were amazed at that time. Eight years. Well, that age has come down to two, two years. Okay. And two-year-olds, you know, they, they can't read. Often enough, they can't read. So uh, how does that happen? Uh, well, you'd be surprised at the answer. Uh, they don't read. They go by a different comprehension mechanism, which we don't understand at all. I can give you another example, an even more amazing one. I have seen people in India like everywhere else, texting each other. You know, all of us do that. But in this country, I have seen illiterate people texting each other. Isn't that a contradiction in terms? How do they do it? You know what they do? They invent language. It's absolutely amazing. Nothing in education has ever seen anything like this before. So uh, should you give your child access? Yes, of course you should. You can't really keep him or her away from it, can you? Because they just get, you know, bad tempered and irritated and so on and so forth. But sit with them, give them a big screen, okay? I, I can't tell you how many times I'm going to say this. Give them a big screen. Give them a smart TV and tell them do what you like on it. And sit with them and see where they go. I once said in England to teachers, some teachers asked me, what's your message to us? And I'd say the only thing I sit with them and say, you go there, I'll go with you. That's about all we can say, isn't it? As teachers, there's so much we don't know anymore. What is the future that you're going to prepare your three-year-old for? By the time he's 33, he might be living on Mars. How is the education system going to prepare him for that? All you can say is, you figure it out. And that's what I think we should tell our children. Give them a good question, or when they ask a good question, give them the means, and then say, you figure it out, because I'm not going to be around. Um, let me see what else we have here in Q&A. Okay, there's one from Ria Sen. What would a curriculum of the future look like? We are in a time of change. So uh, how do we ease the shift from the curriculum to a curriculum of questions? Well, good question, Ria, first of all. Uh, how do we change the curriculum? I don't know the answer. But I know that sitting around and talking about what happened in the past is not going to help. Do you realize that a curriculum is essentially about the past? So if you take a curriculum like a curriculum in chemistry, it's about everything we have learned in chemistry since chemistry began. 
It's all about the past. And we think that if children come out of school knowing everything that humanity has learned, time immemorial, if we pack it inside their heads, then they're going to go into the future and they're going to be able to solve problems. Well, the world used to be like that. It isn't like that anymore. The problems that these children will face, or these students will face, even university students, the problems they will face are unimaginable right now. So what should a curriculum be? I think a curriculum should be not about everything we know about the subject in the past, but about the big things that we don't know yet. So take any subject, take sociology. The curriculum should be what are the biggest questions, the big unknowns in that subject. Take any other subject and make a list of the big unknowns. You know, there's something interesting about human beings. If you tell anybody, here is a question to which no one knows the answer. We are invariably interested. Children are hypnotized by the idea of questions to which no one knows the answer. And of course, in the process of trying to find an answer to the questions to which no one knows the answer, you will automatically bump into all the stuff that we do know, isn't it? So one way to make a new curriculum is to start not with the past, but to start with the future in mind, to say, here are the questions to which we need answers. And I can guarantee you, if nothing else, it will make subjects intensely more interesting than they are right now. Okay, let me see. Uh, Doc, uh, uh, do you mind if uh, Vinay puts up a few questions from Facebook live session as well here, so that you can address them? Your screen just froze. Uh, can we uh, ask a few questions from the Facebook live session? Yes, yes, go ahead. Can you hear me now clearly? Sure, sure. sure. Vinay, can you do that, please? Yeah, so uh, pro uh, Professor uh, Sunmita Shinde asked on FB, Professor, if learning is unstructured, does it lead to more joy than structured one? Well, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you mean by structured. Uh, you know, like anything else, the, the truth is in the middle. Uh, you can't just let children run wild with no structure at all. And obviously we know that a highly structured curriculum is extremely boring. We've all been through that and we used to hate it. But it's in the middle where the interesting stuff is. So if you, if you start a session with a question, and if you say, let's try and figure the answer out. And if you use a semi-structured approach, and if you say, let's do this together, that is at the heart of what I'm trying to say. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, so we have one more question. E-learning will help teaching, but how can we go for online assessment? Okay, all right. I, I, I was hoping that you, you, would, uh, you would raise that. It, it's, uh, it, it's like releasing the tiger from the cage. Okay, how are we going to assess? And you know, let me tell you firstly, uh, the answer is not that we must do away with assessment. That's ridiculous. We need to know. We need to know if, if you if you are um, you know if, if you are going to hire a plumber, you do need to have a method by which if three people apply, you can choose one. That's assessment, isn't it? We assess each other constantly, not just for jobs, but but for friendship, for relationships, for everything. Assessment is integral to our uh, figuring out people. So uh, 
what should the assessment system be when it comes to learners? Well, I would say that we need, we need an assessment system that tests for certain fundamental characteristics rather than focusing on detail. Let me try and explain that. Instead of saying, when was the battle of Panipat fought? A better question would be, why were so many battles fought in Panipat? Use the internet and I'll give you half an hour. The second question enables a learner to use her head and to use the resources of the network, to use her friends, to use everything that she has around and figure out an answer and then communicate that answer as opposed to rattling off a date from memory. So I would encourage all of you who are in education and learning to experiment with this kind of assessment. Don't be afraid of the internet. The internet must be used in assessment. You know, you could, you could do an experiment. You could take your cohort of students, even if they're not together, even if they're at home, give them a question, give them 20 minutes, just like you would do in a regular exam. Now you might say, well, how's that going to work? Because you know, they are all going to use the internet. They're going to telephone each other. They're going to WhatsApp each other. Doesn't matter. Try it and see whether everybody gets the same score or not. If your question is utterly stupid, if it's utterly literal, you know, when did this happen or etc., then yes, everybody will give you the right answer. But if it's a qualitative question, you will not get the right answers from everyone, internet or not, cheating or not, conversation or not. Change those questions. What are you going to test for? Three things. I think our whole entire education system needs to focus on three abilities. Comprehension, the ability to look at something, to hear something, and comprehend. Um, you know, comprehension is not the same as understand. There's a difference between understand and comprehend. So test for comprehension. The second, communication. What's the point of comprehending if you cannot communicate what you have comprehended? Test for that. And finally, just so that it makes three C's, I'm going to add computing. That doesn't mean writing computer programs. No, not at all. It means the ability to use the internet to find accurate and correct answers to problems and questions. So if all of education were to focus on the development of these three qualities, comprehension, communication, and computing, then whether you're developing an electronic engineer or a doctor um, or a geographer, all three are going to need these three basic qualities. How much they know of their subject is perhaps no longer as relevant as it used to be because to a generation that has Google at its fingertips. What does to know mean? You ask someone, do you know this? And what if the other guy says, give me a minute? Well, what are you going to say? Does he know it or does he not? So I often call this the end of knowing and people hate that. But anyway, coming back to your question about assessment, use the internet for assessment. Allow the children to talk to each other but assess on comprehension, communication, and computing. Assess using questions to which there isn't an answer that you can just get by Googling. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from Jayashri Venkatesh. My question is, do you think the soul, with soul, the role of teachers might become obsolete? No. A single one word answer is absolutely not. Two word answer, absolutely not. Uh, why? You know, the soul depends on the question. The soul is driven by the question. So who will make the question? Sometimes teachers say, well, what if we had a bank of questions somewhere on the internet and the children simply take out a question and they do it by themselves? That's not the same thing. Uh, I'm glad you asked this question because let me, let me explain to you how a soul session actually is started. It's not as though you enter the classroom when you had a classroom and you write down a question on the board and walk out. That's not how it works. You have to say, I wonder. The art of building a question is a difficult one. It's more difficult than anything else you've done as a teacher to build a good question. And that's why we need you. We, the teachers, we no longer have to be the repository of answers because the repository of answers is up there in the, in the internet. But we have to be able to ask the questions. And this is not a new concept, by the way. This has been said 2,500 years ago. You, you know who said that, don't you? Oh, you know who practiced that? Socrates. They killed him for trying to change the education system from answers to questions. Uh, uh, Doc, there are uh, there are many people in the Q and A section, and right. their patience because uh, they want you to answer all the questions. So unfortunately, we have. Uh, you know, of course, we have all the time till the time you have the time. So if you could just go, uh, you know, in the Q&A and see whichever questions you find relevant to answer, please. Okay, let me see. I'm, I'm not going to go strictly according to order because then, uh, you know, I, I mean, there are people who have put in questions some time ago and there, there are people who have heard what I had to say and then put in questions and so on. I'm just going to find questions which I find interesting. Well, I will use my own philosophy. I will find the questions that I find interesting and to which I have no answer so that I can continuously talk nonsense at you. Let me try. <laughs> Don't take that seriously. All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, how do we ensure that self-learning continues in the right direction? Sometimes the learning is diverted in various directions as a group. This is from Kekul with us. Um, yes, you're quite right. But there are a couple of things to look at. But first of all, uh, you know, people mix up between the words self-learning, self-directed learning, and self-organized learning. Self-learning or self-directed learning is where you have an objective and you're trying to fulfill that objective by yourself. Self-organized learning is where you have a question and you're trying to examine the question not by yourself, but in a group, and you organize that group. Can you drift off into a tangent? Uh, yes, you can. What should you do if you're a teacher and, and you find that the students are drifting off into a tangent? But depends on the tangent. You know, let me give you an example. In a primary school in England, I had uh, made a question, which, uh, you know, was a bit of an unfair question, I guess. I asked the children, do you know that everything changes with time? And I pointed to a pencil lying on the table. And I said, look at this pencil. Imagine that a hundred years have passed. What would it look like? 
And they said, oh, it will be rotten and it will be broken and it will have turned into dust and etc. Et so I said, yeah, so it will have changed. Why do things change so much with time? And they started working on a soul. There was a lot of buzzing and all of that. And the first breakthrough was a group that said, it all has to do with a word called aging. Things age. And when they age, they change. I thought, that's brilliant, but what is aging? So they went on on and on. They came up and I said, do you have a conclusion? And they said, no, we don't have a conclusion. But there's a question. We want to really examine a, a question. I said, what is that? And they said, we want to know why turtles live so long. So I said, what? Why? And they said, we think if we know the answer to that question, we will have the answer to aging. <laughs> That's where the soul can go, you know. Now here they were, off into a tangent. What a lovely tangent, isn't it? What a lovely tangent that was. So uh, by and large, if your students go off into a tangent, let them be. And use another question later to try and bring them back to wherever it is you were trying to lead them into. Uh, let me see another question. Okay, there's one from Chitra. Sir, I feel a physical classroom is essential. Um, wait, Chitra just disappeared. Uh, where, did, where did she go? Ah, yes. Uh, I feel a physical classroom is essential as we need uh, human contact. Don't you think e-learning will make us more mechanical and isolated as humans? Um, yeah, it does. It's like this meeting that, that we are having now. You know, I'm speaking. I can't see you. And as a speaker, I feel terribly, terribly disadvantaged. I can't see your faces. I can't see your expressions. How do I know if I'm making a point? How do I know I'm not being intensely boring? It's terrible. But technology can solve that. You know, I uh, wrote a blog post recently because I was very annoyed with this whole idea of why is it so different to be physically together as opposed to be as opposed to being electronically together? Um, it, it's it, it's in my on my Facebook page somewhere. Uh, it's a blog called "A Hole in the World." It was just a pun on a hole in the wall. I changed it to a hole in the world. Uh, the idea was that if you and I are sitting across a table face to face, as opposed to if you and I were on Skype with each other, we often say it's not the same thing. But my question to you and my question to many students at uh, NIIT University was, so what's different? Well, we figured out a couple of things. The image needs to be life-size, you know. I don't want to talk to a matchbox-sized version of you. You need to be life-size. The audio needs to be clear, as clear as if I was sitting across the table from you. But even then, everybody said, it still won't be the real thing. So we're still investigating what that real thing is. What is it that we exchange other than sound and light that gives us this feeling of presence? Is it molecules? Is it something else? Is it uh, below the threshold of our senses? Is it some sort of extra sensory perception? I don't know. I, I, it's fascinating. It's one of the things that I would like to experiment with. What does presence mean? But for the time being, a physical classroom means differently from an electronic one, which is why when I started off I said, do not try to recreate the physical classroom in an electronic version, which is what a lot of people are trying to do under the title of e-teaching or e-learning or whatever. That's not the right way to do it. Do things with the 
electronic classroom. Then you're using an aeroplane to fly and not drive. Uh, let me see what else I have here. Okay, here's one from Pankaj Orwal. Google and Alexa are good at giving information, but still have a long way to go for giving insights. I believe one has to impipe a lot of information to get insight, and it will be difficult or almost impossible to get insight if you do not know enough information. What's your opinion? Yeah, I, I agree. You need a body of information. It has to go into your head. It has to get processed. We don't quite know what happens. And eventually you get something called an insight. Computers at the moment cannot give you that insight. But people can, you know, which is why I come back to my old uh, soul model. If four of you are sitting around the computer screen looking at a website, you get a better insight into what that website is saying than if you were alone. So groups have something to do with it. Lots of information has something to do with it. But where does insight eventually come from? We don't know. Some people say with experience. Some people say with practice. I don't know. You'll have to figure that out. Ah, here's a, a, a pretty wait, a nice question went by. You know, these questions, they come and they flip out of view. Here's one from Vivek Tonapi. It's a nice direct question. Will this sole method work for teaching math? Yes, it does. <laughs> In a very strange kind of way. I haven't done it too many times, so you need to practice it. But uh, I'll give you an example. England again. This time it's 10 year olds and they're about to, to learn algebra. They haven't started yet. I uh, did a solve with them. I wrote a quadratic equation on the screen. And the children said, what's that? And I said, you know, it's called a quadratic equation. And they said, what's this? I mean, why are the letters and numbers mixed up together? And I said, I don't know. That's how it is. And they said, why have you written a two on top of the X? Uh, I said, I don't know. I mean, that's what it said. And I said, and then they said, well, what are we supposed to do with it? I said, you're supposed to find out how much is X. And they said, what do you mean? How much is X? X is an alphabet. I said, no, well, it says here to find out how much is X. And I left them with that. Half an hour into the soul, there was a great buzzing sound and I kept hearing the word Damascus. I said, Damascus? What's this? So anyway, I, I, I sort of said, well, guys, I mean, do you have something to say? And they said, yes, sir. This is called algebra. This is a subject called algebra. It originated somewhere in the East, India, China, and then it drifted towards the West. It came into Damascus and wars were fought over it. You know, children, nine, 10 year olds, they, they like this gory stuff of wars and all that. And I'm thinking, gosh, instead of algebra, they didn't have talking about wars. Wars were fought over it and this and that. So I said, okay, that's very nice. Sir. That, that, that's wonderful history of algebra. I didn't know that. Um, uh, but anyway, what about this? Uh, didn't you work on how much X is? And they said, of course, it's whatever it was, 15 or something like that. Oh, we did that in the first five minutes, they said. I said, oh. Uh, the soul ended, and as I was going out of the room, one of the children, really naughty looking fellow, said, oh, by the way, Sudhata, uh, we forgot to tell you something else. I said, what? X doesn't have only one answer. It has two in a quadratic, he said. And then they all giggled. So uh, can you use it for math? 
you can convert math into magic according to me but then as a teacher you've got a syllabus you've got a, a fixed time frame maybe you can play with the soul once every couple of weeks i can tell you this it will make math come alive Well, looks like uh, we're just about out of time now, Ravi. Yes, sir. Um, you know, we could go on forever. I was thoroughly enjoying these questions, but there are so many of them. Um, uh, I hope uh, all of you got some idea of where I'm coming from in these uh, so-called difficult times. Maybe in these difficult times, there lies an opportunity that is greater than anything that education has ever faced before. Well, uh, that's going to disappoint a lot of people. There were more than 200 questions and another couple of hundred uh, on the Facebook Live. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you uh, have your own uh, schedule from here. And a lot of people are coming on chat. I mean, uh, they are saying, thank you, Professor, and uh, great session. And uh, so, so, of course, I mean, I'll give that opportunity to you to kind of conclude this session, uh, Doc. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, you know, uh, what can I say? I, I hope you, you got the central points. I, I hope you got the idea that I have uh, more questions than I have answers, but I have presented the questions to you, the big problems, the big opportunities that are facing us right now. Uh, you, have to, you have to seize the moment. We have to seize the moment and we have to try stuff that we couldn't have tried otherwise. Because then when this lockdown is through, when we are back hopefully into our real world again, Instead of saying, thank God, we could say, thank you, Mr. Virus. Thank you, Doc. I mean, just, just one last thing. I mean, uh, would, you, would you like to uh, give out a, a few tips on how these educators could use uh, this lockdown uh, more effectively? Or uh, if you have a good read in terms of, I mean, any book that you're reading or you would like to suggest any other activity to these educators and then further, uh, you know, when, uh, which they can use with the students or their children at home. So I think I mean, with that, we can conclude this session. Yeah, sure. I, I, I can tell you uh, a few things that you, you really uh, should not do, which is do not assign tasks. Because the moment you do that, the children will say, now we've gone from the frying pan into the fire. So don't assign a task, you know, read this and tomorrow I will ask you a few questions on it. That's what these kids are expecting that you will do. Uh, they're scared of us. So don't do that. But ask them questions. Ask them questions that you genuinely would like to know the answer to. And ask them if they can help you find that answer. Ask them if you can do it together. You know, I mean, I've been speaking about this for, for an hour now. So try and practice that. Uh, it won't come easy, you know, to, particularly for teachers. It won't come easy. because That's not how we did things before. But if you try it, if you trust your children, they will sense your trust. And learn it with trust. Okay, perfect. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, being patient. A lot of questions went un unanswered, but uh, that's how I mean these webinars go. Uh, so, uh, the only only thing that I'm worried about is I mean because of this lockdown, a lot of people uh, may go in depression. So please don't. You guys are educators, and I'm sure you have a lot more up your sleeves uh, in this lockdown. I've heard that a lot of teachers are working uh, double the time uh, which they used to while in the schools. <coughs> <coughs> so, uh, I think, I mean, we need to take uh, care of our well-being and uh, uh, not go in depression and uh, read a lot, listen to music. And if you want to reach out to us, we uh, will collate a list of uh, good free available books on Amazon or uh, might as well a lot of music and maybe a few suggestions on Netflix and Amazon Prime. So, thank you very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Uh, 
Sukhatam Mitra uh, for coming online. And I think, I mean, this is first of its kind webinar going on live on Zoom in India. And we wish to host a lot of other webinars in the coming week. And uh, if you have any suggestions whom you want uh, to come and present on uh, uh, the Zoom live webinars of School News, I mean, please do uh, comment on Facebook. Uh, you know, under the uh, Facebook live session of Doc. Thank you very much, Doctor, and uh, look forward to seeing you in Kolkata or uh, Rajasthan, you know, that romantic border between Gurgaon and, <laughs> Gurgaon and Rajasthan. So, <laughs> and, uh, All the best. All the best, and thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.